welcome guys and girls to another interview preparation video in this video we will go over some of the very commonly asked questions for solutions architect interviews so the questions we'll cover are how can you make your application scalable for a big traffic day how do you achieve disaster recovery for your cloud application how do you secure your application on the cloud describe an architecture you designed biggest challenge faced during designing your application on cloud how do you pick one service versus another as a solutions architect what is the difference between sql and nosql databases and what is cloud computing and what is aws service x so timestamps are included for all these questions and answer and for the answer i'll go over an average answer so some of you might give this in the interview and think oh that answer is fine but I'm also gonna go over some better answers. And if you give those answers, the interviewer will think like you are a real world architect. So for those of you who are new to this channel, uh, my name is Raj. Uh, currently I'm a senior specialist solutions architect at AWS for serverless and containers. Before that, I was a general solutions architect at AWS. Uh, prior to this, I was a distinguished cloud architect at Verizon. I am also a published Udemy and Pluralsight author. Uh, all right, with that being said, let's get started. So question number one, how can you make your application scalable for a big traffic day? So an average answer would look like put the virtual machines or EC2s in auto scaling group and use a load balancer. So nothing is wrong with this answer. Probably three years back, this would have been a great answer, but now cloud is mature. Uh, so any project you go and start working with, they already know about this. So when they come to you as a solutions architect, they expect something extra. So a good answer might be like, I will put my VMs or Amazon EC2s inside a auto scaling group behind a load balancer, but in a big traffic day, such as Black Friday or Diwali, the burst will be too high. So if I let my load balancers to scale up naturally, it may not be able to keep up with the rate of rise up traffic. So to avoid that, I will pre-warm my load balancer before the big traffic event. Similarly, I will use scheduled scaling for my auto scaling group. So all the necessary EC2s are up and running with the application on it. So when the traffic increases, they are ready to go. In case the EC2s do need to scale up naturally, I will make sure that the application machine image is as lightweight as possible. The more unnecessary libraries you put into your AMI, the longer it would take for the EC2s to spin up. If my application is connecting to a database, I will utilize a database proxy such as RDS proxy. In case of high traffic, sometimes applications will make rapid new connection to the database. And when the program stop querying the database for that particular instance, the connection will stay open. So when another traffic invocation comes, instead of reusing that lingering orphan connection, it will create another new connection. So this results in lot of orphan database connections taking up precious compute from your database. Using RDS proxy will eliminate that. RDS proxy will maintain the database connection full. It will reuse the orphan database connection. It will terminate as needed, etc. And on top of this, I will run IEM or infrastructure event management to ensure it can handle high traffic. So unless we have worked in a real world cloud project, you will know about this IEM. So IEM is an event that AWS runs before the big traffic day. So it will scale up the load balancer, EC2s, and then it will pass a high traffic to ensure that the application can handle it. Beyond this, you can also talk about uh, breaking your applications into microservices, talk about advantages of microservices that one specific API might need to scale up way more than another microservice in the same application. Uh, using microservices, you can utilize uh, that individual scaling of each APIs. Sometimes some candidate mentions that, oh, I will just migrate my application into Kubernetes or serverless, and then it will be handled these big, big traffic days which is not true because <laughs> Kubernetes serverless, they all have their scaling limits. 
So if you do mention that, okay, I want to go to Kubernetes or serverless, ensure that you study uh, the scaling mechanism for those. But similarly, in serverless, you need to use provision concurrency, you need to increase uh, limits for API gateway, etc. Similarly, for Kubernetes, study up HPA, cluster autoscaler, over provisioner, uh, reducing the container image size, etc. All right, so moving on to the next question. How did you do disaster recovery for your cloud application? So one common answer I will get is, I will just replicate everything to another region. So this is very blanket statement. So a good answer will be, uh, there are different options to choose from depending on RTO and RPO of your application. If you don't know what is RTO, RPO, please look them up and study. Uh, so there are four different disaster recovery strategies. One is backup and a restore. Uh, then there is pilot light. And then there is a warm standby. And then there is multi-site active active. So the replication is the multi-site active active. And then you can study more uh, on this link. And even when you say, okay, I'm going to replicate everything using multi-site active active, have an example ready. You can show that, okay, I would have uh, two load balancers in two different regions. Those will be fronting the front end and maybe the application server. And a Route 53 can send the traffic to the appropriate region based on the latency. So even if one region goes down, Route 53 will automatically send all the traffic to the other region for the database. If I use DynamoDB, I will use DynamoDB global tables, which will automatically replicate along with continuous backup. If you do use uh, Aurora, look up the similar features in Aurora. So have like a good concrete example ready with details. So next question. So this one comes almost in all cloud interviews. Uh, how do you secure your application on the cloud? Uh, so the average answer would be like use KMS, IAM and firewalls for security. So the problem is explain what they do rather than just saying service names and then take one application such as three tier app with EC2 or microservice running on Kubernetes or serverless and explain in detail. So a good answer might be like Assuming my application is running in a serverless manner, so all the APIs are hosted in Amazon API Gateway, and all the API backend are handled by Lambda, and then that Lambda is going to different DB2s. So I've created three different color arrows to show that there are three microservices running. And then you could say that on the user side, I will implement authentication. I will secure data at transit using SSL TLS. On the API gateway, uh, I will implement the authentication and authorization layer. Uh, so look up my video on API gateway authentication and authorization. Uh, so this is a big topic. So I'm just going fast, right? Because if I want to spend 30 minutes in this answer, I could, but I'm just giving you a high level idea. And then the security of data at rest. Uh, so basically you will encrypt the data at rest using KMS. And the most important part is the security of the application uh, because this is where you'll probably get most of the questions because this shows that you have actually designed and worked in an application. So I'll go over an example of security of the application and I'll use Kubernetes for that because Kubernetes is uh, super hot right now. So generally in Kubernetes, you have your application container image running within a pod and then that pod is running in the data plane, which is Amazon EC2. So application security for Kubernetes will look like uh, you will use namespaces to divide the cluster. Uh, you can separate resource quota and access for each namespace, uh, but for a multi-tenant cluster, by default, all pods can talk to each other. Uh, use network policy to control pod traffic. Uh, you can control traffic by IP, label, or namespace. And then you implement RBAC or role-based access control. Uh, you can specify separate roles for separate groups, such as admin, developer, tester, etc. Uh, do not allow privileged escalation. Uh, prepare for questions on privilege escalation versus root access. And use OPA or open policy agent to enforce restriction. Uh, OPA will ensure that the images 
are coming from uh, approved repository and you, if you have namespace namespace should have a label with point of contact in case something goes wrong etc so the point is have one application ready in your head all right uh, next question uh, describe an architecture you designed so i'll just give a couple of general tips because this is very uh, open-ended question it's always better to explain a system you designed even if small uh, so sometimes i see this tendency that sometimes candidates will give a elaborate fancy example using a lot of things uh, but it's clear that they haven't designed this or worked deeply on it so to give an example uh, for my interviews even for my aws interview which is a pretty big interview for my career i used a microservice design with third-party api gateway with lambda so this is the design i actually used so if you look at it back then we were using apigee and then we had to integrate apigee with the application lambda but then the problem was uh, apigee was multi-tenant uh, so we had to ensure the separation so we had to use like auth lambda and a couple of other things if, but if you look at this architecture it's just one layer right so basically a api platform and then the back end there is no like three tier there is no front end i don't i didn't even put database in here but i designed this and i had to defend this architecture in many many internal meetings so i knew this architecture in and out so I got a lot of questions on different components of the architecture. So even though this architecture is small, but I worked on it, so I was able to answer all of it. So again, to restress my point, don't try to explain a fancy design that you did not try out or that you didn't do. All right, the next question is biggest challenge faced on cloud. The average answer is there are so many services, it's hard to determine when to use for what. So this doesn't tell your interviewer anything really. Uh, so remember, when the interviewer is asking for a challenge, it's a two-pronged question. He or she wants to know the challenge as well as how you overcame that challenge. So a couple of good answers could be, you can use the scaling example you went through, right? Because you could say, uh, I thought that using a regular auto scaling group would take care of the high burst, high scaling criteria but then it did not, so then I had to do all the additional things. So study the answer for the first question in case you just jumped to this question, skipping the first question answer that we did. Uh, but another, another answer could be, it is challenging to cost optimize the applications. And you can give an example that uh, we are trying to design a Kubernetes application, uh, but there is no restrictions on how big the pods could be, how big the nodes could be so applications are just spinning up stuff incurring a lot of bill but we are not using whatever we are spinning uh, so how do you fix this so you could say that use amazon cloudwatch insights and amazon cloudwatch insights along with aws compute optimizer identifies whether your aws resources are optimal and offers recommendations to improve cost and performance you can mention about the spot instances you can also mention that uh, for research purposes, you used AWS Cost Explorer, um, which goes over the billing and usage report in detail. So if different teams using different EC2s, different tags. Also, if you have used any third-party tools, you can mention that uh, use KubeCost or CloudHealth. There are many others, but these two are the popular ones. Um, and for KubeCast, if you do mention the name, make sure you just test it out. It's very, very straightforward. But just make sure you understand uh, what extra feature does KubeCost provide. So it provides some extra features that your regular uh, Cost Explorer doesn't provide. All right, going next, how do you pick one service versus another as a solutions architect? So this is one of the hardest question that you will face in the interview. So ask interviewer about the system requirements. You could ask like, uh, is this system having like a steady traffic or there could be high burst traffic? Uh, what is the SLA response time for the APIs? Does everything needs to be synchronous or can some stuff can be asynchronous, etc. And then you just got to study for this one. There is no <laughs> easy answer, unfortunately. Uh, so I have multiple videos on this. So take a look if you are interested. 
So some of the popular ones that you get asked is uh, whether should you use a load balancer or API gateway, should you use serverless or EC2, uh, when to use even bridge versus SQS versus SNS, uh, what is GitOps or should you use DevOps, should you use Kubernetes or Lambda, uh, and then the last one is there are so many container options to run your container on AWS such as EKS, ECS, Fargate, Elastic Beanstalk, LightCell, AppRunner, uh, when would you choose what? So I have detailed video on each of these, so you can search on my channel and check them out. The next question is also super common. Uh, what is the difference between SQL and NoSQL? Uh, so the average answer is SQL holds structured data and NoSQL holds unstructured data. You can define indexes and run queries on SQL. SQL is good for transactional system and NoSQL is best for logging. So why is this answer average? So this is very basic answer. It doesn't highlight the strengths of modern NoSQL. Modern NoSQL databases support indexes and also used in transactional systems as well. Uh, so a good answer will go over basic properties as well as ACID versus CAP, different scaling behavior along with examples. So yeah, I have another video on that, so check it out. So next question is, uh, what is cloud computing? So the, this question and the next question is more about preparing and memorizing some stuff. So the average answer is cloud computing is storing your data and servers in data centers that you don't own. You can run your applications on cloud. Some cloud examples are AWS, Azure, GCP. This, this answer is average because it doesn't really highlight the advantages of the cloud. Uh, so this is the standard verbiage, so you should just memorize this. And I have given the link if you want to study more. So when this kind of question comes, what I do is like, I try to memorize the popular stuff and then I'll explain in my own language. Like say this answer first and then you can explain a little bit in your own language. Generally when I get asked this question, after I say this part, I'll also give an uh, example of electricity like, Cloud computing is similar to consuming electricity because you just flip a switch when you need electricity and you just flip it off when you don't need it and you only pay for how much electricity you consume. Next question is very similar. What is service X? Uh, so sometimes when I ask this question, the candidate will stumble and try to explain. So it's very difficult, right? Because you know, sometimes you know a lot about a service and it's very difficult to give a succinct answer. Say the official definition, just one line, and then you can explain in your own words. So these are some of the very popular one, like one example is EKS, like Amazon Elastic Kubernetes Service is a managed service that you can use to run Kubernetes on AWS without needing to install, operate, and maintain your own Kubernetes control plane or nodes. So I actually have like 10 of AWS services memorized because uh, I go to customer meetings all the time and sometimes if I'm talking to uh, CTOs or directors, they sometimes don't know, right? And that's very natural. They, they deal with very high level problems. So if I mention something, they will say, hey Raj, what do you mean by cloud formation? So I'll just have this line memorized. So I'll say the line and then explain a little bit more in my own language. All right guys and girls, that's all the questions and answers. Also, if you have faced any particular interview questions that you had difficulty explaining, please post it in the comments. I will make a video on it in the future. If you found this video helpful, if this was useful, uh, please click subscribe, click the like button, smash it if that's something you are into, comment, uh, share this channel with your friends and family, help this channel grow. All right, that's it for this one. I'll see you guys and girls in the next video. Bye.